On February 3, 2024, the US Central Command, CENTCOM, released a statement detailing joint strikes conducted by the US and UK, targeting the Houthi rebels in Yemen. The statement briefly answers three questions – when, where, and why. When, on February 3rd, around 11.30 p.m. Sana time, which is 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Where, at 13 locations within the terrorist-controlled area of Yemen. And why, to respond to increased destabilizing and illegal activities in the region. However, CENTCOM's statement didn't mention anything about the how, so let us fill you in. For these airstrikes, the US deployed the Navy's most advanced carrier-based multi-role strike fighters available today, the FA-18EF Super Hornets. This fact raises another why question. Why were Super Hornets used to devastate the Houthis? Though, let's be honest, if you aren't familiar with the Red Sea Crisis, the answer to the first why question, why were the Houthis targeted, won't mean much to you. So let's give you proper answers to any questions you might have about this situation. Let's start with what exactly happened on February 3rd. As mentioned, multilateral coalition strikes were launched against the Houthis, who had been redesignated as terrorists by the US Department of State on January 17th. These strikes were primarily conducted by CENTCOM forces and the British Armed Forces, with support from Australia, Bahrain, Canada, Denmark, the Netherlands, and New Zealand. The strikes hit 36 targets across 13 locations in Houthi-controlled Yemen, including underground storage facilities, command and control centers, unmanned aerial vehicle UAV storage and operation sites, missile systems, radar installations, and helicopters. But why these targets? Because they were used, either directly or indirectly, to attack international merchant vessels, the Royal Navy and the US Navy ships in the Red Sea, Bab el-Mandeb Strait, and the Gulf of Aden. Based on the targets involved in these strikes, it's easy to conclude that the US and UK intended to degrade Houthi capabilities to continue their unlawful attacks on vessels in the region. If you're well-versed in US military equipment, the list of targets will also tell you why the Super Hornets were used. If not, don't worry, we're about to break it down for you. When it comes to the equipment used for the strikes, one location is of particular importance – the underground storage facilities. The February 3rd statement by CENTCOM is the first time these facilities were included in the target list. The nature of these locations likely has something to do with the choice of fighter jets used to strike them. You see, the Super Hornets can release GBU-24 Paveway 3 bombs that offer unique functionality. Namely, these 2,000-pound laser-guided bombs can penetrate hardened structures before exploding, making them ideal for striking underground facilities like bunkers and command centers. The GBU-24 bombs are precise enough to fly down ventilation shafts into hardened targets, but they do need to be controlled by the aircrew until impact. This makes them different from the Joint Direct Attack Munition JDAM, weapons deployed in the region, as these use GPS-guided bombs. Besides the underground facilities, another target on the list was taken out by the Super Hornets, the Houthi radar installations. However, this time, the US used a specialized variant of the two-seated Super Hornets the EA-18G Growler. The Growler is a carrier-based electronic warfare aircraft that can carry extensive radar jamming equipment as well as the AGM-88 HARMS. To understand the purpose of these missiles, all you need to know is what HARMS stands for, which is High Speed Anti-Radiation Missile. In other words, AGM-88 HARMS home in on surface-to-air radar systems and neutralize them. These two uses alone should tell you how versatile the Super Hornets are they also warrant a closer look at the Boeing FA-18EF Super Hornet weapon series. The Super Hornet is the Navy's primary strike and air superiority aircraft. It's an updated version of the original Hornet, the McDonnell Douglas FA-18 Hornet. So what makes this new Hornet iteration super? The short answer is enhancements in size, range, and capabilities. But if you're looking for more details, let's look at some numbers. The Super Hornet features a roughly 20% larger airframe than the original Hornet. This airframe is also 7,000 pounds heavier when empty and can carry 15,000 pounds more than the FA-18 Hornet. The same applies to the internal fuel department, as the Super Hornet can carry 33% more internal fuel. The result? This highly advanced aircraft has a 41% longer mission range and 50% higher endurance. Talk about impressive! Of course, the significantly larger weight means that the catapult and arresting system must be set differently. 
Interestingly, the Super Hornet was supposed to be even heavier by as many as 400 pounds. However, Boeing managed to keep its weight lower while still meeting all the necessary performance requirements. Speaking of performance, the Super Hornet can perform virtually any mission in the tactical spectrum. In this video, you've already heard how it performs in two of these mission types, night strikes with precision-guided weapons and the suppression of enemy air defenses. However, the combat-proven Super Hornet can also be sent on a number of missions like day strikes with precision-guided weapons, fighter escort, close and deep air support, maritime strike, forward air control, tanker missions, reconnaissance, and others. Impressive, right? Well, we're just getting started. During these missions, the Super Hornet can also be armed with a wide range of munitions, in addition to the Paveway laser-guided bombs and AGM-88 harms we mentioned. In the intense strikes in Yemen, the Super Hornet showcased its versatility and power. It wasn't just equipped with the standard loadout, this fighter jet was armed for a diverse range of threats. For taking down Houthi drones, it carried the agile AIM-9 Sidewinder short-range air-to-air missiles, and to counter enemy ship missiles, it deployed the AIM-120 AMRAAM, capable of beyond visual range strikes. But the Super Hornet's arsenal doesn't end there. It's a true multi-role fighter, armed to the teeth with an array of weapons for any scenario. Its M61A1 A2 Gatling gun systems offer rapid-fire precision. The AIM-9X Sidewinder and AIM-7 Sparrow missiles bring a triple-threat capability and medium-range radar homing, respectively. It's equipped with Harpoon missiles for all-weather anti-ship warfare and slams and slammers for standoff land attacks. The Maverick-guided missiles, Joint Standoff Weapons, and Joint Direct Attack Munition Kits further expand its capacity for precision and power. This extensive and varied armament truly puts the multi in multi-role fighter, making the Super Hornet a formidable force in any combat scenario. However, the Super Hornet is not just a formidable combat aircraft. Its versatility extends to playing a crucial logistical role in the skies. With its Advanced Aerial Refueling System ARS, the Super Hornet seamlessly transitions into a tactical airborne tanker. This adaptability is a game-changer for the Navy, especially considering the vacuum left by the retirement of the KA-6D Intruder and Lockheed S-3B Viking tanker aircraft. But just how does the Super Hornet fare in this newfound role? When it comes to fuel capacity, it's on par with the revered KA-60 Intruder, this comparison not only highlights the Super Hornet's multifaceted capabilities, but also prompts us to delve deeper. Here's another fun fact you may not have known about. The Super Hornet's ARS includes an external 330-gallon tank with a hose reel and four additional 480-gallon tanks for a total of 29,000 pounds of fuel on the aircraft. Besides an impressive fuel capacity, the Super Hornet boasts the ability to return to the aircraft carrier with a larger load of unspent fuel than the original Hornet. But as impressive as the Super Hornet is, this aircraft wasn't the only equipment used during the February 3rd strikes. According to some reports, the Tomahawk Land Attack Missiles TLAMs, were likely used to target UAV storage and operation sites, as well as helicopters parked outside. This brings us back to the why question from the beginning of the video. Why did the US and the UK strike terrorist-controlled Yemen with such ferocity? Well, these strikes were a direct response to a barrage of Houthi attacks into the Red Sea, which the CENTCOM labelled as one-way UAVs. Of course, the Super Hornets were also used to shoot down these drones, all deployed from the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower aircraft carrier. But here's another why question for you. Why is protecting the Red Sea of such high importance? Perhaps President Joe Biden can chime in with an answer to this question, as he called this sea one of the world's most vital waterways. And that's precisely what the Red Sea is. This crucial maritime choke point connects the Mediterranean Sea to the Arabian Sea, and in turn, the Indian Ocean. With the Suez Canal, this sea provides one of the fastest and shortest ways to travel between Asia and Europe. With this in mind, it shouldn't be surprising that as much as 15% of the global trade passes through the Bab al-Mandab Strait at the southern end of the Red Sea, and in turn, the 120-mile-long Suez Canal. In 2023 alone, roughly 21,344 ships have taken this route, which comes out to about 58 vessels per day. Though the Houthis haven't primarily targeted these vessels, global shipping companies have mostly decided to reroute their vessels either way, thus avoiding the potential conflict zones and ensuring the safety and the security of their assets. Of course, these moves are bound to have disastrous global economic repercussions. 
After all, rerouting means that ships must go around Africa through the Cape of Good Hope, which is significantly longer, costlier, and less efficient. To understand just how less efficient this route is, all you need to know is that it adds between 3,000 and 6,000 nautical miles to the ship's journey. So let's say a ship is traveling from Shanghai, China, the world's largest container port, to Rotterdam, the Netherlands, Europe's largest container port. Typically, this voyage would cover about 10,600 nautical miles and last roughly 27 days. However, when rerouted, the ship must travel at least 13,800 miles, which adds a minimum of seven days of transit. If there are multiple ports of call, this figure can increase to 10 to 14 days. Still, the way the companies see it, it's better to arrive at your destination later than not at all. That's why it shouldn't be surprising that the expected freight container volumes through the Red Sea region fell by as much as 78% in January 2024. But what do the Houthis gain from such a massive disruption to global trade? Or in other words, why did they even start wreaking havoc on the Red Sea region? To understand the answer to this question, you must first learn who the Houthis truly are. If you ask the US Department of State, the answer is simple. They're a specially designated global terrorist group. But if you look at the Houthi movement from their perspective, they see themselves as a political and religious faction seeking representation and autonomy for their community, the Zaidi Shia Muslim minority in Yemen. Of course, this still doesn't explain their actions in the Red Sea, but bear with us, it will all make sense soon. You see, the Houthis, or Ansar Allah, as they're officially known, are part of the Iranian-led Axis of Resistance. Beside the Houthis, the informal political and military coalition includes the Syrian government, Hezbollah, a Lebanese political party and militant group, and various Palestinian militant groups, including Hamas. Most of these groups are designated as terrorist organizations by the US, with Syria designated as a state sponsor of terrorism since 1979. Unsurprisingly, the US is exactly who this coalition sees as the enemy together with other powerful Western nations. The same goes for the Arab countries of the Persian Gulf and Israel. Now that both Israel and Palestine are in the picture, you might see where we're going with this one. Yes, the Houthi attacks in the Red Sea started shortly after Hamas's October 7th attacks on Israel, which claimed around 1,200 lives. When Israel invaded the Gaza Strip in response to these deadly attacks, the Houthis vowed their support to Palestinians and started attacking commercial vessels they claimed were bound for Israel. The US responded by forming a multinational coalition called Operation Prosperity Guardian in December 2023, consisting of 10 known and 10 anonymously involved nations. This coalition was designated to protect commercial shipping in the Red Sea. Soon after, in February 2024, the European Union also launched a naval mission, Operation Aspides, to protect the cargo ships in the Red Sea. So far, Germany, France, Italy, and Belgium are planned to contribute ships to this mission headed to the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. But as important as Operation Prosperity Guardian is, not all US attacks have been part of this military operation. In fact, the primary strikes we're discussing today, the ones led by the Super Hornets, were conducted outside Operation Prosperity Guardian. Though the Red Sea attacks are a central part of the Red Sea crisis, this crisis is also a part of the broader proxy war between the US and Iran. After all, Iran is who presumably arms the Houthis, enabling them to target ships and cause chaos in the Red Sea. Though Iran denies these claims, it's abundantly clear that the Houthis couldn't operate at such a high level without the arms, training, and intelligence of one of the strongest armed forces in the world. That's how the Red Sea crisis has been able to become a tit-for-tat military standoff between the Iran-backed Houthi movement and the US and its allies. On their own, the Houthis would never be powerful enough to stand up to, let alone provoke, the most powerful military power in the world. With this in mind, let's go through the most significant developments in the Red Sea crisis before and after the Super Hornets got involved. In early November, the Dwight D. Eisenhower Carrier Strike Group IKECSG arrived in the Middle East amid rising regional tensions. This is also when intense Houthi attacks were taking place on the vessels in the Red Sea began. On November 19th, the Houthis landed a helicopter on the Galaxy Leader, a Bahama-flagged and British-owned carrier traveling from Turkey to India. They seized the vessel and rerouted it to the Hodeida port in Yemen. As of February 2024, the entire crew aboard this ship, 25 seafarers, is still held captive. Since the seizure of the Galaxy Leader, at least 40 ships have been attacked by the Houthis, primarily in the Southern Red Sea. The Bab el Mandeb Strait seems to be their location of choice, as they often attack vessels as soon as they enter the strait. 
Given the strait's relatively small dimensions, roughly 20 miles wide and 70 miles long, and strategic importance, it should be clear why it's been chosen as the primary location of the Houthi attacks. However, the Houthis didn't stop at attacking the ships. They also launched numerous ballistic missiles at Israeli military posts. Most of the initial Houthi threats were identified and neutralized by the Israeli Defense Forces IDF. The first notable time the US IKE CSG got involved was on December 6, when the USS Mason shot down a drone launched from Yemen. Throughout December, the US forces continued downing a barrage of drones and missiles sent over the Southern Red Sea. Toward the end of this month, the F-18 Super Hornets had their first notable engagement in the Red Sea. Launched from the USS Laboon on December 26, these fighter aircraft destroyed 12 one-way attack drones, two land attack cruise missiles, and three anti-ship ballistic missiles fired from Houthi-controlled Yemen. This is roughly the same time that Operation Prosperity Guardian was established. However, the situation didn't get any better after December 2023. In fact, the conflict only intensified in January 2024. On January 10th, the Houthis launched a large-scale attack against some of the IKE CSG vessels, as well as the USS Laboon and HMS Diamond, with at least 21 UAVs and missiles involved. The US responded on January 12th, bombing dozens of Houthi-linked targets in Yemen, together with the UK and other allies. It also marked the first time Houthi targets in Yemen were bombed since the beginning of the Red Sea Crisis. This time, the Tomahawk missiles were used to strike 28 locations within Houthi-controlled Yemen, killing five Houthi fighters and injuring six. Like the February attacks we discussed at the beginning of this video, these locations primarily included command and control centers, munitions depots, production facilities, launching systems, and air defense radar systems. All in all, over 100 precision-guided munitions of various types were used to strike these locations. Besides US Tomahawk missiles, the UK Eurofighter Typhoon multi-role combat planes had a notable role in these strikes. Four Typhoons left the Akrotiri Air Base in Cyprus just hours before the strikes, carrying a payload of 500-pound laser-guided paveway bombs. These joint US and UK strikes continued throughout January. Most notably, 14 missiles across Houthi-controlled areas in Yemen were destroyed on January 17th while a January 22nd attack took care of eight Houthi targets in the vicinity of Sana'a airfield. As for maritime combat, most Houthi missiles were shot down before they could cause any damage. However, a January 30th missile got close enough to the USS Gravely that the destroyer had to employ its close-in weapon system, CIWS, to down it. It's also the first time a CIWS was used in the Red Sea theater. This brings us to February, one step closer to the third day of the month when the US unleashed the Super Hornets on the Houthis. But what preceded this day? On February 1st, the Houthis fired several anti-ship ballistic missiles on the merchant vessels in the Red Sea. Luckily, all of these missiles hit the water before causing any damage. The very next day, the Houthis launched nearly a dozen UAVs, all shot down by USS Kearney and USS Laboon. Super Hornets armed with the Sidewinder short-range missiles likely took part in these counter-operations. Having had enough, the US and UK launched the February 3rd attack on dozens of Houthi locations, undoubtedly the largest scale operation in the Red Sea crisis. The Houthi spokesman, Mohammed al bukaiti responded to these strikes by declaring that the group would meet escalation with escalation. Houthi media also listed the names of 17 fighters killed during these strikes, following public funerals in Yemen's capital Sana'a. However, despite the Houthi threats, most of the devastating attacks following the February 3rd strikes were launched against them, not by them. For instance, on February 24th, the US and UK conducted another joint airstrike, hitting 18 targets across eight locations in the Houthi-controlled zones of Yemen. Again, these targets were underground weapons storage facilities, radars, helicopters, and UAV systems. With the inclusion of underground locations, you can already guess which equipment made another appearance. That's right, the Super Hornets. As for the British forces, the British Ministry of Defense said that four Typhoon fighter jets supported by two Voyager tankers participated in these strikes. According to the Houthi official news agency, these strikes reportedly killed a civilian and injured eight more. If true, this would mark the first civilian casualties of the joint US and UK airstrikes against Houthi-controlled Yemen. However, in spite of the heavy losses the Houthis have suffered, they don't seem to be backing down. 
So let's answer two more questions pertaining to the future of the Red Sea crisis. One, why aren't the significantly less powerful Houthis retreating? And two, how big of a threat are they really? Let's start with the second question. The Houthis boast an estimated 20,000 fighters and a range of fearsome ballistic missiles and drones. As explained, most of their military equipment is either supplied by Iran or at least based on the country's design. Before the Red Sea crisis, the Houthis successfully deployed these weapons against Saudi and Emirati military and infrastructure targets. The most notable weapons among them are the Shahab 3 medium-range ballistic missile, with a range of over 800 miles, the Ghadar medium-range ballistic missile, an improved Shahab 3 variant with a range of up to 1,200 miles, and several anti-ship ballistic missile models with ranges up to and above 500 miles. If you crunch these numbers, you'll see that most of Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Iraq, and Israel are within range of these missiles. This includes several U.S. strategic facilities such as the al Udaid Air Base in Qatar, Camp Arif Jan in Kuwait, and the Naval Support Activity Naval Base in Bahrain. But even so, what makes the Houthis a massive threat isn't their military capabilities, it's their mindset. This also answers any questions about their persistence in the Red Sea crisis. You see, the Houthis have been in a state of war for over 20 years, and as far as they're concerned, this state can go on forever. As Hussam, a 24-year-old from Sana'a, told The Telegraph, the Yemeni people are prepared to take a beating for the sake of their homeland, pride and honor. That's why it shouldn't be surprising that the US and UK strikes seemingly embolden the Houthis rather than scaring them or compelling them to stop. The way they see it, they can't lose face both domestically and internationally, the only option is to continue. For this reason, it's highly unlikely that the US will resolve the Houthi conflict through a purely military solution. Even if the country's armed forces were to invade the Houthi-controlled parts of Yemen, they would hardly accomplish anything. Why? Well, for one, there's no central command to attack and force to surrender. By their very nature, the Houthis are a decentralized group that operates in a highly adaptive manner. This mode of operation would also allow them to hide in mountains or tunnels until the threat passes, making it nearly impossible for a conventional military force to achieve a decisive victory. The same goes even if the US only sticks to targeting the Houthi military equipment. The drone systems supplied by Iran are cheap and easy to transport, so the Houthis can constantly replenish their supplies. It would take the US and its allies a lot of time and money to continue taking out each and every one of these systems. Worst of all, even though the Houthis are often seen as nothing more than an Iranian proxy, the truth is that the group is pretty self-sufficient. And while Iran and its regional allies want to avoid a major conflict with the US and its allies, the Houthis' intentions are less clear. As Bilal E. Saab, the director of the Defense and Security Program at the Middle East Institute MEI, in Washington, D.C., puts it, it's going to be really hard to tame them. It's going to be really hard to rein them in. But what do you think? Do you believe the US resolve might fade over time, especially considering how much the country is needed in other theaters? Or do you think the Houthis represent too big of a threat for the US to back off? And if strikes in Houthi-controlled parts of Yemen continue, how big of a role do you see the Super Hornets having? Share your thoughts, opinions, and theories in the comments section below. Now go and check out why pirates don't stand a chance against the US Navy, or click this other video instead.